Hey everyone, um, welcome to um, Control N November edition, um, last Control N for the whole year. Um, absolutely wild um, to think about, I guess, like where, we, where we've come from. Um, um, but I'd, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I give this webinar and we conduct our business every day, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, just to like say that some of these lands was never ceded and reconciliation is an ongoing process. Um, and we each have a unique role to play in advocating for the rights of Indigenous Australians. Um, so guys, thanks for joining. Um, the music was vibey, the sun is shining. We see summers around the corner um, and it makes us really excited. It makes us excited because there's always here like opportunities. The weather's lifted, the mood is up, we're out of lockdown. Um, but I think it's really important today and the, like, the, the whole basis of our discussion today is to really talk about something um, that we're seeing play out in the media a fair bit. Um, in a recent McKinsey study, the top three reasons employees cited for quitting were not feeling valued by their organizations, not feeling valued by their managers, or they didn't have a sense of belonging at work. If these past two years have taught us anything, is that employees want to feel human at work. They want their employees to know that and they want their employees to invest in their working experience in order to get the best output. So when an employee suddenly leaves um, for an early stage startup, it can be a huge expense. Retraining when resources are already constrained can be daunting. And even as a scale up, when there is already intense competition for scarce talent, thought of having to stall even for a moment can keep founders up at night. And now we look at global trends like this event called the Great Resignation. And we start to wonder, is this gonna to happen to us? What happens if we can't match the salary of really large businesses? How are we gonna hold on to our best people? I saw an article the other day um, that said the top 20 to 30 ASX listed companies in Australia are doing a massive hiring drive and noted that there's 5,500 vacant positions currently out there. And this is only expected to increase. So for a lot of us, we hear people talking about attrition, but what if there's actually an opportunity for attraction? Now, before we get underway, um, introduce our amazing guest for today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Josh. I'm the head of labs here at Luna. Um, for those of you who don't know us or don't know what we do, we exist to help founders launch, grow and scale their businesses by connecting to a range of services. We have a labs team, which is the team that I head up um, we focus on building education that leverages the commercial knowledge we've gained from working with thousands of startups. We work with schools, universities, um, corporates and founders designing and implementing bespoke learning around entrepreneurship and business skills. We have a legal arm which focuses on everything um, that a startup could need from setting up everything operational all the way through to taking on first, second, third, fourth, fifth round of investment and buying and selling at the very end. We have an accounting arm, which helps with, at the very early stage, just getting you set up on accounting software so you pay less in tax, typing, tax time, um, bookkeeping, um, GST, all the way through to virtual CFO to help you understand your financial data to make better decisions. Um, in terms of this webinar, it's going to run for about an hour. Um, I'm very proud today that I brought the Lunar Banner at home with me. So welcome to my home office um, today. Um, we have. Um, we'll have about 10 minutes of questions, 10, min 10 minutes for questions at the end. So if you do have any questions as we're going, I'll try and incorporate them. So feel free to post them in the Q and A. Um, there's a chat function as well, which Nikita just posted some Twitter handles in, which you can definitely use to follow the conversation, but please for all questions, um, pop them in the Q and A and I'll ask them as we go. Nikita will be live tweeting the event today using those um, handles and hashtags. So please feel free to go ahead. Um, and after the session, we'll be share recording and any resources that are mentioned as we continue this conversation. So answering my question before, how do we turn lemons, potential lemons into lemonade? How can we view this expected upcoming period as not a danger, but an opportunity, an opportunity to improve ourselves and improve the way that we work? What kind of groundwork do we have to do? Fortunately, today we have an incredible, incredible um, person, Dr. Zivit Inbar. Um, you only have to speak with Zivit for a fraction of a second to know that she really understands the space that we work in. 
sitting at the cross section of talent and culture and leadership. Zivit has an incredible understanding of how to build capacity in both startups and scale ups. Um, Zivit has over 18 years experience of leadership experience at board and executive levels and has worked with numerous organizations to transform their leadership style and team cultures, including LaunchVic, CSIRO, and First Choice. Zivit, welcome. Hi, Josh. So <laughs> glad to be with you all. Thank, Thank you, you for, for inviting me. Thank you for joining us today. I think we have a really exciting topic, but before we jump into it, um, can you just tell everyone here, because I think, you know, I can only give a partial explanation of your amazing experience, but can you talk to us a little bit about your background and how you came to find yourself in this like startup scale up ecosystem? Um, I almost grew up in the, in the startup scale up um, ecosystem. I started my career in Israel many years ago when the ecosystem was just in the beginning and um, I was asked to come and work in a small consulting firm that specializes in scaling up, up startups. So that's not recruitment. <coughs> Sorry, what we did was um, building the culture, scalability plan, um, leadership, coaching for founders, and really doing the lean HR work with them to help them grow and scale up. Um, after about a couple of years there, I moved into the mantra. I was the um, 25th employee, initially just to help with recruitment, but we raised capital as soon as I got in. And um, yeah, within a year, we opened branches in Boston, London, Belgium, Holland, France, Germany, increased our team to about 200 with um, contractors globally. And I had a DHR, so my career as an executive in a scale up was really sharp was there for five years and then almost 18 years ago came to Australia to do my PhD and back into um, global heading um, as uh, chief human resource officer, heading global technology companies, scaling up and leading um, HR through APAC, US and Europe. And um, I did that three times and then I decided to open different thinking and really the ecosystem just began here. So really contribute to the ecosystem and, and work with us startups and scale-ups. That's awesome. I think it's so relevant to be able to bring that like global perspective and experience to like the fledgling ecosystem. It's awesome now that we're like the ecosystem is starting to grow and starting to gain in reputation like locally and internationally as well. So awesome to be part of that journey. Um, yeah, definitely. Today we're kind of talking about, you know, the on the on the hold screen, we spoke, we we spoke about this this concept of the great resignation. Just so that you know us and all everyone listening in today is on the same page. What is the great resignation in your view? So look, the great resignation is a global phenomenon. Um, initially, the term um, was called from the US, but we see it in other countries as well. As they went out of the lockdowns, people start um, resigning in levels we've never seen before. Um, <clears throat> In Australia, we haven't seen it yet. What we did see it in the tech industry in, for example, in Melbourne in April and May, there was a good exod exodus of employees, but then as the lockdown started, in lockdowns, people less um, tend less to move. Um, there are a couple of reasons why it is expected to hit Australia in around February, March, 2022. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, the market, the tech market is booming. There are thousands of new positions. It looks as if all of a sudden everyone realized that technology is important. And I'm not talking about startups and scale-ups. I'm talking about government and cyber and all the organizations all of a sudden realize that technology is important. So we have thousands of new positions. We have um, a talent pool that literally shrank during the, um, the COVID period. Salaries are on the rise. On the other hand, people have gone through a change process. Um, and there are many resolutions, reflections. And what I, I, I see in the market is that um, many people have now an appetite for a change as of a personal change that is my career <laughs> divorce you know it doesn't really matter what it is but um study a new topic or what so personal change moving ahead but 
I would rather say zero tolerance for organizational <laughs> structural changes. And so um, together with the fact that uh, many of our talent are from overseas and they haven't seen the family for two years, families for two years, there's this environment of, of change, personal change that is about to come. I just want to say something about, about it, Josh, in terms of last week there were a few articles saying the, this great resignation is not seen in Australia and will not come to Australia. And they were building their assumptions on the ABS and Treasury report. So, you know, um, it's very important to, to read the research method, not only the results, right? Uh, the ABS is saying there hasn't been movement in organization during COVID. Again, they checked the entire Australia, not specific industry. Um, and the Treasury is saying, well, we have seen stagnation in salary increase. And I think, um, who, you know, all those founders that are now with us know exactly that there was no uh, stagnation in, in salaries in the tech industry. So really, when we're talking about the great resignation in Australia, we're talking about tech positions. Um, rather than entire Australian entire positions. And so like, you know, by extension, that impacts startup scale-ups directly, right? Correct, uh, yeah. And I guess, you know, on the flip side for a startup and a scale-up now, like not being prepared, what is like the, the major outcome for them is what? Not being prepared? Mm. Uh, the window of opportunity for startup and scale up is very, very narrow. So not preparing for it could be, you know, survive or not survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I, I think it's so interesting. Like survive or not survive is really comes down to like how well can you secure talent and how well can you prepare for this un, this upcoming like event that we we expect to happen. Like, what do you think are the key things that founders need to safeguard for their companies and for themselves in order to prepare for the great resignation Feb, March, 2022? Um, so there are three areas that I think are the most important to look at. It's scalability planning and talent strategy, organizational culture and leadership. So I'll start with scalability planning and talent um, strategy. Um, you have to ensure that you have a scalability plan for the growth and that you have done your risk analysis for retention and that you have a lean talent strategy. I'm not talking about process, procedures, policies. I'm talking about a lean talent strategy. So basically saying, <clears throat> all right, we are at risk. We've done this analysis. We're risk, at risk of losing people what type of positions, what people, acknowledging that I will not be able to retain everyone. How do you identify who you can't afford losing? Um, how do you tailor specific retention plans for them? Um, what do you need to change in your talent planning? How are you planning to attract new talent in such a competitive environment? And it is a competitive environment. The, the large organizations have much more resources than us. They can just, well, I see it all the time. They just offer 20K more and that's it. Um, <clears throat> including, by the way, how are you going to manage the annual leave this summer and ensure that you can um, still deliver? So we said survive or not survive. The people are, is, is the execution. You won't be able to execute on your strategy and achieve results without talent. So you need to prepare yourself rather than finding yourself then, um, you know, um, people are starting to live in you and, and you're getting into a panic mode. So that's in terms of the scalability plan and the talent strategy. Organizational culture, so people leave their managers and people leave organizations that they don't like being um, part of. It is really essential that the founders now will understand their organizational culture, um, the good DNA, the bad DNA. We are in a fortunate position 
Um, the longer the organization exists, the more difficult it is to change the culture, but startups and scale-ups have the agility. Um, so we can actually change fairly quickly. Um, what we know is that organizations that have over 40 or 50 employees and everyone were working from home have developed subcultures. So when we are all in the office, um, the collaboration is different, the visibility is different. When we just work from home, we tend to work with our own team or our own division department. There's less cross collaboration. And so those teams have may have developed subcultures and certain behaviors that are you know, productive and safe or not. So we need to understand what are those subcultures. Um, conducting an external organizational diagnosis is the best way to know it because people just won't, or often won't tell you the entire truth. And if you put a survey in place, then, you know, what do you get from the three, the four, the five? It's not qualitative information. So that's the organizational culture. And then we talk about the leadership. Um, we cannot assume that our leader, people leaders, so it could be team leaders, managers, doesn't matter. Every per people that lead people know and have the tools how to deal with this situation from the well being of our employees to preparing to, there is a, to retention, to building high performing teams, all those skills are now very important. So I think this is the time to, to really invest in, in our people leaders, in their training or coaching, whatever you want, but just don't let them fly as if assuming that they have all the, the tools to deal in this situation. Cool. So there's three things. Maybe if we just focus on the scalability plan first, what I'm really interested in is um, to our lovely listeners today, um, I'm actually going to share a, share a poll. And I'd love to know from you, in light of knowing about the great resignation, Zivit just mentioned a scalability plan. Do you have any plan or strategy for the summer up and coming up to the great resignation? I've shared the poll now. I'd love for you to know just a yes or a no. In light of the great resignation, do you have a plan for this? How cool is this? Just getting like live feedback straight away. Um, and it's really interesting, right? Like we're kind of seeing a third of people do have some kind of plan, but two thirds just don't. Whoa. Does that, does that surprise you? Uh, <laughs> it doesn't surprise me, but... Um... Yeah, I'm, I'm thankful for the honesty, but I think you may want to revisit this. And, and I think that part of the problem is why it doesn't surprise me, because there's this concept of HR that is putting those long processes and bureaucracy and stuff. Scalability planning is a fast process to put in place. It's lean. It's more a thinking process rather than... Um, yeah, so people are thinking scalability plan and it's going to take me a month and I need someone external or whatever. No, this is not the situation. And so what are the first steps? Like, you know, I think you reeled off a whole bunch of things that need to happen. What are the first steps? Like I'm a founder, I'm an executive in, an org in, a, in a startup or scale up. What, what do I need to put in place to start putting the scalability plan together? So there are a few things to think of this. As I mentioned, the scalability plan is more of an, a decision-making exercise rather than a project management um, tool. So we need to think about our strategic goals, where we want to be, by when, and what resources we will need in order to achieve, to execute on this strategy. Um, when are we going to need these people, these resources? Um, where are they currently in the market? How are we going to attract them? Looking at our own teams, um, who has the, potentially, the potential to grow to one of these positions? And if we do have these people in, internally, how are we going to facilitate this growth rather than just jumping, you know, throwing them into the cold water? What can we do to facilitate the, the growth? Um, <clears throat> to deliver the strategy, we will, um, will we need the same skills that we currently have? 
Um, and that is a challenge that is unique for scale-ups and startups. Today we are here, so these are the skills that we need, but our strategy is actually somewhere else. We will need different skills. So do we really have the same skills that we need? Um, do the people that we have now have the, capa uh, the capability to take the scale up to the future? I'd like to um, share, it's a very simple slide, but I think it will um, make sense um, to, for, for people to see hierarchically. Oh. We've lost use of it. <laughs> have you? Well, um, we, um, I'm not sure if you're sharing your screen currently. No, uh, can you see me? First of all, my video disappeared. Let me try again, otherwise we won't share and I'll describe it. Um, now the share screen, the share screen doesn't work. Okay, so basically think about a normal large organization and we'll say, let's say we have three levels of, of management. There are the executives, there are the managers and the team leaders, right? So the executives, they have two major roles. They look for the long term of the organization and they, they look outside. So managing stakeholders, boards, etc. The manager's level really run the operation and the team leaders are responsible for the problem solving. Now, when we start, when we open a startup, we are really at the level of problem solving at team leader. And then we raise some angel money and then we scale up a little bit and we become like managers. We still at the operational level. But when we raise series A or B, we need to step up for the executive. So we really need to think differently. We're now responsible for the long term, for the strategy, the, for the, uh, um, the stakeholder managers and the level under us is responsible for the operation. Then we have the team leaders. Now, um, no matter where you are in, in the journey, you really need to now, if you're at the team leader level, you need to start thinking about developing because to, to scale, scaling up meaning building these capabilities. So it's not only the technical skill capabilities, it is also the soft skills, the leadership capabilities in the organization. Um, Zivit, uh, we got a question from Cliff. He says, any good resources for training the team leaders in retention? Oh, great question. In terms of reading materials or, or courses? Um, let's try reading materials. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preempt Cliff's response. It, yeah, Cliff I know. I, uh, there are so many reading materials. There's plenty on LinkedIn. Um, I actually wrote quite a few on LinkedIn and posted, uh, posted it on, on LinkedIn, um, but I don't know any specific good book about it that it refers to startups and scale-ups, unfortunately. That's cool. We'll, we'll, we'll speak after this and maybe we can think of something for you, Cliff. Um, yep. You know, and, um, and so I think it's, you know, when we think to like startups and scale-ups and building the scalability plan, to you know, encourage our current structure to grow into our future needs. Um, what did you mean when you said like a retention plan? What did that? What did that? What did that kind of look like for you? Um, so how are you going to retain your team? It's not the perks. Mm -hmm. It's not bringing them back to beers on Friday. Okay. Um, I believe. At certain level, you need to do something for the um, that is common denominator for everyone, which normally it will be the employee value proposition. Um, that I strongly recommend to have something lean again, just lean. Um, but also, if there are people that you can't afford losing, um, I think you need to be more in touch with them personally understand you know take them for coffees understand what they're happy with what they're not happy with where they want to be in their careers um what 
what will keep them in the business and it's not just money it's often opportunities to contribute or develop and and basically take good care of them build a retention personal retention plan in addition to the the employee value proposition that uh, we have for everyone mm, i love that i love that and then you know if we think on the flip side you know for two-thirds of people listening in they don't have a scalability plan so what are some of the biggest mistakes that are made when actually creating one for your, for your organization? The big mistake is not to have one <laughs> or to have a vague one. So that is, and I hear it a lot because, um, you know, startups get to 50, 60 people, they, they bring HR in, often people that are recruiters that don't really understand HR and that, those people say, well, we need a, a scalability plan is 60 people. Cool. Who are they? Where they come from? When are you going to recruit them? What does it mean about your team? You know, all those questions need to be asked. Just saying, as, um, and, and I get where it comes to when you go to raise capital and you take a number, the investors or the VCs will ask you, okay, what are you going to do with the money? And you say, all right, I need 60 people. That's fine. But that is at that level to really achieve the 60 people and to really deliver the results, we need to go to the scalability plan. Right. And so it's it's interesting. It's like not only a tool for decision making, but a tool you can talk to with investors as well and say, not only do I want 60 people, but here's my plan for going and getting them. Yeah, yeah. And I know, I know that these positions are more difficult to get in the market. So I'm going to start recruiting them before I actually need them. Um, and I've done my risk analysis. And these are the people that are really critical for me. So I'm taking care and I have personal retentions for them, et cetera. And you mentioned this is like an agile thing. Like we can, you know, our advantage as a startup and a scale up is we can do this quickly based on our needs today. How do I use this kind of tool in like day-to-day decision-making? How much or how, and how often should I be revisiting something like a scalability plan? So from my perspective, I believe that the um, best value is actually going through the exercise itself Mm -hmm. Um, because this exercise helps us reflect, uh, reflect about our current team and where the growth uh, and how we're going to grow and, and, de- and deliver. It is not a project that then I'm looking at it on a, on a day-to-day, but it, once I've done it, it really helps me in making crucial decisions to, um, um, through this scalability plan and then revisit it on, on a regular basis, depends on, uh, on the need. And we got a question from Shuyen. I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. What is an example of an employee value proposition? Um, so when I help startups of scale up, develop an employee value proposition, um, first of all, it's after understanding what the team, you know, is happy and not happy with and what will retain them and also looking at the external talent and, you know, what will attract them. But we're really looking at, um, the entire life cycle. So it could be, um, something that is related to personal development as of courses or, or whatever. And it could be something that is related, unique that is related to well-being. And it could be something that is financial, you know, just looking at different aspects of our employee experience and putting something in place that um, will keep people engaged and um, will help in attracting the team. Having said that, people will not stay in the organization if they are not happy, if they are bullied, if their environment is not good, if, you know, it helps, but the, the culture is the most important. Mm, mm. So culture is this overarching thing that helps drive mm. some of the employee value proposition. Yeah. Um, Jordan has a follow-on question. Um, if retention about uh, an employee value prop is about an employee value proposition, how do you tailor that? Uh, how do you ta- tailor that to an individual retention plan and still maintain equitable treatment and expectations amongst all other employees? Okay, I'll give you <coughs> the best way for me is to give an example, if that's okay, Josh. Yeah. Um, we have the EVP. Everything is in 
but we identify that this person we can't afford losing, not because that this person is holding information back, but because we're talking about a top gun that can help us grow the company. Um, so then we had the conversation with this person to understand what he is happy with and not happy with. I'm, I'm saying he because that's I have a specific um, example in my mind. Um, and turn out that this, you know, and part of the discussions was, you know, where do you want to be in three years in your career? And turns out that where this person wants to be is not where the skills are at. Um, so as part of the personal retention, we built a development plan, how to bring this person to the place um, that will then we will be, a, in, be in a position to give this person an executive position and, 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 and you know, and develop on the way. So that's a, a personal retention plan. It um, has, you know, the other employees wouldn't know about it, let's say this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you've maybe identified someone as a key leader in the organization. Um, and then you, you've put in a put in plan a place to help them get to that key leadership position and leverage the most out of that EVP that you've developed. Yeah, but, you know, in, in one of the organizations, we had a um, gorgeous QA person that wanted to to be a, a product manager. She didn't have these skills. It's not just about leadership, right? Um, <clears throat> So slowly, slowly, first we moved her to BA and started exposing her to clients. And then we sent her to a product management course. And when she was ready, um, because she was gorgeous, but you know, it takes, you know, product managers need to speak with clients. It's you know, different skills. When we felt comfortable that she was ready, only then we uh, developed. But she knew that this is the path that mm -hmm. we are taking. And so she knew that, if she continues with us, she'll get where she wants in her career. Yeah, I think it's I think it's super important. Um, I'm want to take a bit of a different track now and talk. You know, you mentioned three things before um, the scalability plan, which I think I hope everyone here has a good, some good first steps to take and to like build their own. The second thing is about um, leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we talk about leadership, it might be founders, executive, you identified a few, a few different types. Um, what should founders be doing to retain the right type of talent for their own organizations in, from a leadership perspective? First of all, we need to identify them. Mm -hmm. And they're not necessarily our friends and we don't necessarily go to the pub with, right? But we need to identify and we need to decide what is the definition of talent. Because um, there are people that are really, really, really good for now, but we may not need them in the future. So we, we, we need to have a think about that. Then personal retention plans, as we mentioned, um, we need to remember that employees leave their managers. So ensure that we have good team leaders and good managers on the floor and that we support them and develop them. And then um, in our industry, one of the unique stuff is, is, is that people don't like stagnation. Our team members, the good tech people, like to solve difficult problems, but also they like to see that they are continuing with the technology and that they are developing. So we need to give them the opportunity um, to, to develop and not less important, hire right. Um, the cost of recruitment that you mentioned before. So the cost is estimated for every new employee is estimated as, as 18 months of salaries. And that includes the recruitment fees, the time, the mistakes that the person, the training that we need to give, the influence on the entire team. There's a lot that is taken into it, the lack of productivity at the beginning. So it's about 18 months. So if we hire people that don't stay with us really two years we've wasted our money and we need to hire correctly and so how can leaders i guess in an organization set themselves apart to actually contribute to a stronger retention rate as an individual leader um leading people with empathy, um, care, 
developing others, empowering others, creating an environment that it's safe to, to fail. I don't know, the trial and error, if you can call it even a failure. Um, it's creating a different, uh, creating an environment that people are engaged in. Um, we cannot motivate people, right? It, motivation is something internally. So it's about building an environment, creating an environment that uh, engages people and the engagement brings the internal motivation. Um, and so when we talk about like um, leadership skills, um, and developing leadership skills. Actually, maybe this is this is a great moment for um, to launch a question. Everyone who's listening in, I would love to hear from you. Maybe can you just rate your top three, your three strongest leadership skills here today? Um, what do you think you're you're best at here? Um, it might take some time. There's a bit of a list. Um, would love to hear from you. What are your top three um, leadership skills in your organization? Um, you know, just choose three. You might you might be able to choose more, but you know, just choose three. Um, um, and I think it's it's it, like it's interesting, like when we get to see the results of this and pe see, you know, people people voting in accordance with where they're what they're thinking and where they're at. You can see that like empathy st and strategic thinking are, 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 are really high up there, as well as developing relationships based on trust. Um, is the are these like kind of common traits that you see leaders exhibiting of it? Um, so you said um, so the top three results we empathy, have empathy, strategic thinking, and relationship um, that build trust. This is amazing, fantastic. Um, let's start with the trust. Trust is the core. Okay, we in leadership. Oh, I can see it now. Ah, but it's actually positivity got 25% as well. Um, trust is the core. We, we are entrusted with power um, to deliver a service, right? So we, we cannot um, lead if when we lose trust um, of our employees, our board, our customers, the market, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So that's very, very, very important. Um, but we have to ensure that the level under us is trustworthy as well, that they treat people with empathy. And, and if I'm treating people with em empathy, most likely that this will penetrate across the organization and strategic thinking um, is very important as well. Um, we need to think about it, not only as internally, but um, because, Leadership is also our ability to work with our stakeholders and develop the business. So if we have empathy to our, with, we build empathetic relationship with our stakeholders, that's really putting us in, in a strong place, strategic thinking um, and building trust as well. So well done. Um, and I guess, you know, we've got, you know, common, you know, things that people see themselves as having great strengths in. For a leader, what are the shadow sides of some of those that can maybe you, you might not be aware of on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, sorry, Josh, can you repeat? So based on the questions, like the responses that we have here, you know, empathy and strategic thinking mm -hmm. as being strengths, are there shadow sides to those strengths as well? <laughs> Every strength that we overplay has, has a problem, right? People that are thinking very, very strategically often are not too much into the details. So um, I love entrepreneurs. All my career has been with entrepreneurs, but many of them are like those rabbits that run very in, in the cartoon, runs very, very fast and leave all the dust for someone else to, to pick up, which is great. You just need to complement and make sure that you bring the right people to pick up the um, um, empathy is very important, but sometimes we do need to make tough decisions. Um, and so we need to think about that. Yeah, certainly. Um, and what do you think, I guess, like based on like these leadership skills, like I've identified that I have some strengths um, mm -hmm. and then like linking this back to like my scalability plan, I've got strengths. Do I then start to look at like the complementary skills that I need in my organization to help it grow? So, 
here is what I called, I, I have this tool that I call team up. It really is about not my skills, but the founder skills together that we need to assess where, where are we all overlapping? Where are the gaps? And then complement these gaps. There are things that you can outsource when you know the startup is small. There are things that you can't outsource, leadership you can't, for example. Um, but as we grow, as we scale up, we need to bring people that complement us if we mm. want to succeed. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And I think, you know, for leaders, um, I, I guess I'm interested to know from everyone here as well. What about the strength? What about the skills that you probably need to refine the most, you know, are coming up? If we're talking about scalability plans and retentions, what are the skills that you need to refine the most? Just name your top two in this little poll to give us a bit of direction here as well. Um, what do you think of this? So this is the exact same list as before, but what are the top two skills that you need to refine that you need to do a bit better at for yourself? I'd be really interested to know as well. Um, I see that, you know, delegation is, is sitting quite high up on this list. And Zivit, I'll share with you in, in just a tick. Um, delegation is kind of, is kind of leading ahead, um, followed by, you know, storytelling and building high performing building high-performing teams. Um, awesome, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing, sharing these things. It's really interesting. I'm going to share the results with you as well. Look at this. You know, 52% of people who responded said delegation could creating capacity for others to solve challenges. How can leaders hone in on the skill of delegation, become improve, improve that skill for themselves? actually work with founders um it's it's much simpler than you think there are tools to work on it and it's natural because at the beginning you do everything and then as the company grows you need to delegate you need to release you're not going to succeed if you're not be, going to be able to um <clears throat> like in the workshops that i do often i found that there are common reasons why people do not delegate so there are tools that help you to delegate and, um, and, and I call it delegate and control, very simple tools um, to use that help in that. It's very important. There are things that you will never be able to delegate. That's okay. But the majority of your work, you should be able to delegate. You should be able to build trust uh, relationship with the people you, de you delegate with. Um, and so what are, what are, do you have an example of one of those tools or something like that, the, like a framework to help with delegation? Yes, there, are, um, there is a framework that helps in deciding what to delegate and how to delegate. And um, I can't show it because I can't um, share from some reason, but it really is a simple exercise that you learn that there are different levels of delegation. There are things that I can do on my own. There are things that I can do with help for, uh, from someone else. There are things that someone else could do with my help and there are things that someone else can do without my help. So I just teach how to work with this and how to delegate. And the more impo most important part is that um, the delegation discussion. So to put the, the, the rules of delegations very, very clear in the communication and that helps. Um, I just want to say another thing that we, we not often often think about it but delegation is the best way to um, train our team and in retention the more we delegate we develop them and we give them new challenges so it's just about really it's like one hour coaching and that's it you, you, you start using the tool but it's ne you need to understand that this is a retention uh, tool as well um, and I think that's really interesting that like, you know, being a good delegator is a retention tool. And I think, you know, the second highest result here was building high performing teams or driving high performance. Did you have any thoughts on, you know, that, that as a skill and improving that skill? Um, driving high performance includes all sorts of tools. That again, it's just understanding some of the things and learning how to drive the performance from others, which is not difficult to learn. Um, building high performing team 
is very important and we need to, every team has its own dynamic. And whenever we, there is, we change, there is one change in the team, the performance of the team um, is, is affected. Um, so again, there are tools how to, how to develop those skills. Those are not skills that take forever to learn, unlike some other skills. Um, we've got a question from um, Fiona, which I think is Paul. Um, is coll collaboration and leveraging strengths across the business more important than delegation, especially in startups and scale-ups? Um, they are combined, right? Because when we collaborate, we we, it, it's a type of, of, of delegation. Um, I don't think that it's more important. I think we need to be able to have both of them. But as the startup evolves, um, the founder's role is not the collaboration, is to facilitate the environment of the co collaboration and make sure it's part of the culture. Um, and part of it is done by um, delegation. So as, the, as, this, as we scale up, and our, the delegation becomes very, very important for the founders. Um, but it not, it's not on behalf of collaboration. My role now becomes as an executive is I had the culture and I need to ensure that I have a culture of collaboration, but I also need to, to be able to delegate to the operational level. Mm, that's 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 really um, interesting. And I guess like for those founders that maybe had some trouble answering the questions, how can I start to identify the skills that I need to refine the most, you know, as a leader or for my, my leadership team overall? Um, so you can do 360, but not the official 360. If you want to do the official 360, go ahead, right? Um, <clears throat> but just think about it in terms of having coffees with employees, but not the employees that are close to me, not necessarily. Um, those that will tell me what I want to hear and that I have good reports with them, um, with my board, with investors, with customers. And it's not about asking what do I need to improve. It's just generally learning about how I, I'm interacting, what I'm doing well, and learning from it what I need to improve. That's one option. The other option is, is doing coaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Sounds, sounds simple, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess what I'm hearing from you is that like most of these like skills that we had up um, um, that you can learn in some, in some way, shape, or form as, as a leader in your organization, is that right? Leadership is, you, you don't, uh, you know, we, we are not born leaders. It's something that we need to, to grow into and learn. The important thing to remember is that when we establish the startup, we need certain skills to success. These are not the same skills that we need when we scale up. So in, in some of those skills take a good 18, 18 months to, to to develop. So no matter where I am today, where the company is today, I need to do this analysis and say, okay, in 18 months, two years from now, which skills I'm going to need and how am I going to develop them? Yeah, that's great. So that's such an interesting point that, you know, 18 months to get mm. that like uh, diffusion of those skills into my everyday skill set, which is seems like a crazy, uh, a long amount of time to develop it. But I guess it also speaks to like being prepared and thinking about it now to help you be the leader that you want to be tomorrow yeah the process that we uh, um, um go through in in leadership in the skills is we start we are not aware of a skill like we have this we are unconsciously incompetent right and then something happens and all of a sudden yeah i realized for the you know two years i need to be able to be very good at that so it that point I'm conscious of my incompetence. Then the, the, the part is doing all that I need to do, which is consciously working on those skills, which is draining and hard. But one day it will become natural to me. I won't need to work hard. It, I will be unconsciously competent. So I'll wake up in the morning and all of a sudden I love it. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm doing it naturally. That's that what takes the why it takes such a long time. That's that's so interesting. And do you think that like if I don't focus on them, they improve, or do you think it's like something that has to be a conscious and conceited effort? Um, if I'm not aware of my gaps, I won't be able to develop. So the First, I need the self-awareness. And, and, and that is not only personally, that is about our employees as well. First, I need to be aware of that there is a, pro, a, a gap in my skills. Then I need to be willing to get out of my comfort zone and, and try new things. Only then you can bring the training, the coaching or whatever to help it. But with lack of self-awareness, it's very hard to grow. And do you think, and Alfred's got a, a great question, which was actually going to be my next question as well. Do the, these considerations for like leadership skills change over time as your business evolves and matures? Certainly, yeah. The role of the founders as we grow, as the company grows, they, as, as I mentioned before, we move from the problem solving to the operation to the really strategic long term and, 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 and um, the leadership part. And, if we don't go through this process of the growth, that's when you will see that um, founders raise capital, but then um, the new board then replaces the founder from a CEO back to CTO or, or, or make those amend amendments. We, we have to have this awareness of keep on developing ourselves. Um, awesome. And then like the third thing that you said up the top was organizational culture. <laughs> And we yeah. like, you know, you build a scalability plan, you'd like have leadership, but this overarching thing about culture. And I've spoken about culture before with some amazing, um, with some amazing um, people, um, just like last, last control. And we spoke with um, Emma and Hiam from the culture equation. Um, I'm keen to get, I guess, your, your view, like very briefly on culture. Um, do you think there are some early signs that like something in my organizational culture is a little bit off from your experience? Um, the, the signs can be, there are signs, are external and internal. So the external sign would be, you know, we're losing to the competition or our relationships with the market is or with core partners are getting cold there and things like that. Internally, there are plenty, uh, plenty of, of signs that we can talk about, but it starts with, you know, the atmosphere, the fact that um, ta the talent are leaving us. So um, employees will always leave us. The question is who are? And often top talent don't like to stay in a mediocre thing. Um, so it's actually those that we wanted to keep are the ones that, that are leaving and those that are comfortable and are not our talent are the ones that are staying. So who are the people that are leaving us? Um, it's no longer fun. It's very difficult to make organizational changes. Uh, we're not as agile as we were before. There are resistance, there are rumors. Um, there's lack of collaboration within teams, between teams. Those signs are very easy um, to pick up the internal signs, much easier than the external signs. But the external signs are there as well. And you know, if I'm, if I'm sitting here as a founder, listening in and I'm like shit I think there are some internal signs um you know and I'm coming up to summer and I'm putting in a scalability plan and maybe I'm seeing these signs what can I do to start to like remedy these like what are, what are the like some steps that I can take the the most important part is the diagnosis to understand what's working what is the good DNA what's not what's not working and then so once I do the organizational diagnosis we come up with a change plan Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, the longer or like you look at the universities and the hospitals, you know, making a change in the culture there is almost impossible because the longer the organization uh, exists, the rooted the, the cultural issues are, the cultural DNA. Are. But in our environment of startup and scale up, it is relatively um, easy. It often comes to leadership issues we weren't aware of, some processes to fix, and and and, and some issues in 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 culture that are easy. Um, but no cultural change will work if the top 
lead, leadership is not really modeling the behavior that we want. Mm, that's so interesting. And it has to be a top-down approach from a cultural perspective to make it, it work. Um, Zibit, we're just out of time now. Um, and I really appreciate you um, coming in and like, you know, sharing your thoughts and sharing your experience. It's been really insightful to me and like, you know, going away thinking about like, well, what does the, what does the summer look like is, you know, I've got a lot of things on my mind now. Um, if someone's looking to get in touch with you and chat to you, um, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, call my mobile, send me, send me a LinkedIn message or go on different thinking. Um, um, so it's different thinking with one T in the middle, .com.au, and you can actually book um, a catch up with me online immediately from the website. Awesome. Um, Zivit, thanks so much for your time. Today. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and th thanks for spending an hour with us in our, in our community today. Thanks, Josh, for inviting me. And I hope I was able to contribute some thoughts to our founders in the ecosystem. <laughs> Thank, you. Um, Thank you. Have up, a lovely day. Upcoming, we've got some um, we've got some really exciting events coming up uh, towards the end of November. Um, we've got a couple um, workshops on investment strategy. So we'd love to um, you to come along to that. We're really like synthesizing our learnings um, from helping early stage founders raise over $130 million in the last couple of years. Um, so helping you build out an investment strategy for you. They're closed um, workshops. Um, Nikita is going to share a screen very shortly. They're closed workshops, 20 people max, um, really drilling into how can you build at your investment strategy. Alfred, I'm not at Luna Park, but how I would love to be um now and i just go on a roller coaster in my lunch break everyone thanks so much for coming thanks so much for for joining us and we'll catch you next time